Hi everyone, my name is Felina and welcome to Felina's Pages. Today we're analyzing the poem After by Philip Burke Morrison, another video in my GCSE prep playlist, onto the context and the summary, then the line-by-line -line analysis. Philip Marston, born in 1850, died in 1887, was an English poet in the Victorian times who through his life faced a lot of hardships. And so I find it particularly inspiring that he still managed to find beauty in life and be melancholy about how short life is. I spoke about the Victorians in my Love in a Life video, so check that out for some more insight, but just in a few words. The Victorian age was the golden age of literature. The, it saw an increase in novels and people specifically embracing empirical evidence and so novels covered a wide range of social issues, but it also saw poetry. There was less romanticizing of the past and the present, like in Romanticism, and it's also notable to mention that Victorian literary society was quite impressed by Marston's technical ability in his work. Fireworks. <laughs> At age three, he became partially blind because he consumed belladonna, which is, well, quite poisonous, and so it resulted in the loss of his vision. Not completely, so he wasn't completely blind, but he was partially blind, so although he could see things, it was quite hazy, and that, of course, played a huge influence on his work, since his imagination was left to fill in the gaps. And actually, as he got older, sadly, his vision deteriorated even more. Marston was quite happy. He had a married relationship with Mary Nesbitt, but then she died, and then his sister died, and then his other sister sister died and then his other sister's husband died and it was just a lot of grief in a very short amount of time and so after that his poems they changed they became much more melancholy whereas before they were more concerned with nature pretty incredible considering his limited vision now although they were also concerned with nature like in the rose and the wind which was concerned with the beauty of nature too there was also just like the presence of death a darker element that showed that death was always just kind of lurking by and honestly after all the grief that philip marston faced who can blame him in After, the narrator thinks about the brevity of life and all of the pleasures that it has to offer, the gentleness and the kindness and the love and the fun. However, each sentence is punctuated with an end and with a reminder that all of this must come to an end. And the result is a melancholy poem that reminds the reader of how precious life is and how it's something to be enjoyed while we, while we still have it because it's finite and it might be gone at any moment. It's addressed in the second person and although contextually we can of course speculate that the system Mary Nesbitt, it still feels ex like extremely personal and it still feels like the narrator is talking directly to us and it makes the message all the more powerful, it makes us listen all the more harder to the truth in these words. After is an emotional poem and for me it evokes this weird sense of nostalgia, almost as if I'm already departing and I'm looking back on the memories that I had the privilege of experiencing. Pause here to read the full poem. After is a very straightforward poem, it's much more to the point, it's much less obscure than the other poems that I covered before, but hopefully, since it is more straightforward, you still find something interesting in my analysis, or at the very least, it helps you prepare for the exam. Okay, a little time for laughter, a little time to sing, a little time to kiss and cling and no more kissing after. No sooner do we find ourselves basking in this fun and laughter and in the pleasure of these moments, just if you've had these moments where you have the time to do a little bit of laughing and a little bit of cozying up to your close friends and like to your close family and just to really enjoy that time with your loved ones, you can tell that time passes differently. It's a different sort of living than you usually do when you just carry on with doing stuff even on your own it's just a different sort of feeling and these actions for me i can't help but associate them with the sunlit memories even though of course there's no such sun as we're inside but it's just these imagery associations and i think that's something very important to mention in the personal response but no sooner do we find ourselves whisked away enjoying life enjoying the kiss and cling and laughter then we have this sharp cut, the severing of the guillotine with the line, and no more kissing after. We have what's called an anaphora, repeating little. The word little is of course everywhere throughout the poem. It's constantly emphasized to show how limited everything is, how we have these moments, and there's not much punctuation except for the very end. It's just these moments of fun and enjoyment 
like one by one by one all to be severed all to show how brief life is the iambic rhythm punctuates the lines especially little and time in particular and it seems like a metronome or a clock rigidly punctuating every second of our life as time passes the good the kiss and cling and the bad when there is no more kissing after. Here we should also look at the speaker's relationship with Mary Nesbitt, how there really was only a little time for laughter and only a little time to show his love and then suddenly it was all gone and we were in the after. The double T in little just accentuates the word so much and the, the word itself is so quick, it seems to dart out before you can't, like before you can't quite catch it it's little it's very quick it's just suddenly out there and i think it's quite perfect for a poem about the brevity of time there is also a little bit of reiterations throughout the whole poem like the next stanza starting with a little while rather than a little time but ultimately it all follows the same path and what i what i think it's trying to show is that no matter how you start with a little while or a little time it's all just destined to end there's an end to everything to all of these moments of fun and laughter there comes a time where we all must face and we all must encounter the after that we keep talking about that we keep mentioning also we have the words laughter and after as you can see when you say it i don't know if it's quite clear but the ter sound so like laugh it's not stressed it's kind of prolonged and this is called catalexis because it just sounds weaker than the rest of the word and it, it, it's written in this style that makes the word seem weaker and i think that's particularly suitable to the word after because it's almost like the speaker has just so much difficulty getting it out of him so much fatigue and so much exhaustion at even thinking about this word is like after he kind of trails off to just let the word take its part because he knows that it will take its due course whether he likes it or not and in cling of course well not letting go and not being able to let go and i think this poem is well the the narrator not wanting to let go but having to and on to stanza two a little while for scheming loves unperfected schemes a little time for golden dreams then no more any dreaming in stanza two we continue to feel the sharp pain of marston's loss how his golden dreams will never realize how there's not really any more dreaming and planning or scheming for the future because the after is already here the golden dreams could be quite literally as in him thinking and like having aspirations for the future that will never be realized because his love is gone or this could be less literal and we can think about him being blind and seeing everything in a sort of haze so this idea of vision is very precious to him of course because he's losing it and he's already had the opportunity to see the world much more clear but now with every passing second it grows less so and everything becomes unclear and dreamlike and so this golden dream is almost like ironic because he's losing it so quickly his very life before is very much a dream and his pain here is very prominent especially in the next stanza when he says about a ruined heaven so he had his heaven he had his life and now it's becoming ruined so now he's just slowly approaching this ruined heaven this point where he can't return to the golden haze of his dreams and now that his vision is disappearing and his wife is dead so suddenly we just realized that throughout this poem there was never exactly any visual imagery there was only auditory imagery and we filled in the blanks ourselves. and he was scheming loves unperfected schemes he says unperfected so unperfected as in not mastered as in the sketch and not the finished product and i think this line also makes the stanza way more prominent because we have this hopeful note that it's unperfected that maybe we have this chance to perfect it because look at it i mean he's scheming right so he's already planning to improve love to improve his plans to improve his general relationship with his wife to show her how much she means to him and to just have these plans of how to spend time and maybe he's even hopeful that his vision will recover but he only has a little time and that limited time is just gone instantly so he never has the time to fully realize these plans there's also quite a lot of e sounds like scheming schemes dreams dreaming and i think this makes the word sound way longer than the word really is like dreaming which is just very sad considering we know that his time is so limited and he constantly reminds us of it 
A little while it was given to me to have thy love. Now like a ghost alone I move about a ruined heaven. The words given and have are very notable antithesis to each other. They convey extremely different ideas. And whereas before the giving and the taking was, I don't want to say subtle because it was quite obvious that it was this carrot that he extended to us the reader like oh come here i give you this this moment of joy and then the sudden hard cold hitting truth of no i'm taking it away your time has already come no it's like that's it this is all the fun that you get it was quite obvious but here it's directly drawn attention to it's it's saying that it's given to have thy love because it's drawn attention to it makes us realize how much we got given and how much we got taken away exactly we were given a little time and we had your love but that's it, that's all there was. Stanza 3 is the moment the whole poem turns, whereas before it was a little bit of, like I said, reminiscing, nostalgia, how it was something in the past, now we have that action, we have the word now, our attention is drawn to this word because now we are in the after that Marston talked about and how I wish we weren't here because we see how desolate it is without his wife and without his love and just exactly what it's like. What makes it even sharper is the fact that it's a very brief vision. I don't know if this is only me but it seems like after seeing that word now we instantly get thrown back into the structure of things this like seeing and experiencing love and like saying and having that time and having it taken away from us and it's as if like knowing that this is the structure we willingly return to it because we've seen the after and we've seen what it's like wandering around by yourself and in the now the simile like a ghost there is of course no clear way to draw attention to death and i think what's m more subtle is how he almost seems to talk about how his wife left him not by choice but because of death we have this intervention of death this, of this ghost but of what is very clear and what is very surface level i think without having to dive a little deeper and kind of pull its strings is the fact that he himself is like a ghost he com he compares himself to this creature that's not living and it's as if he lost a part of himself so now he just wanders around alone alone i move about the ruined heaven i mentioned previously because this is it his soul has departed and he is alone a shadow of his former self like i said after is a more straightforward poem in terms of like what's happening and i think it's to show how the narrator in a way strips life of its complexity how he just resolves it to well to the fun and to the taking it away to the life and to the death to the now and to the after and in stanza three we are also addressed for the first time and realize that this is an ode to life and to love and to the finality of it all. A little time for speaking, things sweet to say and hear, a time to seek and find thee near, then no more any seeking. So the fourth stanza is, in my opinion, much less m important than the fifth and the sixth stanzas, where we have what we call a volta, which is just basically a quick shift in ideas. However, let's take a quick look at stanza four. In stanza four, narrator draws our attention to how we only have a limited amount of time to get our point across, to say what we want to say. And I think it's a lovely message because we have only this limited amount of time, so you should use this time and to be nice and to listen to what others have to say. We also have this life to look and look and to live and to live and go on looking and to search for our purpose and to search for our love and actually Marston says that he finds it because he finds her but then after there is no more any seeking he cannot look for her anymore either because she is dead and he just physically can't go after her and seek her in this like new final end to things or because he only has one true love and it's her so even after she's gone he just doesn't have that energy to continue looking for the purpose of life and for maybe another woman to fill the gap and the void in his heart because this is it, she was his everything. Stanza 5 is a very smooth transition, a little time for saying, words the heart breaks to say, a short sharp time wherein to pray, the no more need of praying. So Marston reiterates once more, whereas before we had speaking, now we have saying, and it's a subtle difference but I think an important one. Saying is more important, you can speak 
just all day just get those words out but saying is something much more important much more inherently meaningful it's because you're not just speaking and throwing words out to just kind of like get rid of them you're using your words exactly what you want to say it's this meaning that you give to these words we have to use the opportunity to say to express our love to really show the people that we love how much we love them to express this while we still have that time with them and to really like pray and to say our goodbyes because this is not even a little time this is a short time we have a sharp uh, a sh short sharp time we're in to pray the no more need of praying we have the little time between love and death to say goodbye and marston is saying by reiterating that you need to say this you need to use that time and to say that goodbye because there is no praying after because after they are gone and there's no need to pray and like the rest of the poem uh, in the actual lines themselves there's not really many sessures like commas and i think it's to show that you can't really prepare yourself for that finality that comes at the end that final full stop the lines yes they continue yes of course we get shown how these moments are punctuated but even this practice is absolutely nothing compared to the end, to the full stop that follows words like after dreaming heaven seeking but long long years to weep in and comprehend the whole great grief that desolates the soul and eternity to sleep in the connective but draws attention to this final line to this final stanza to this final idea to this final turn it's everywhere this is the end of both the poem and of seemingly life itself we have long long years to weep in whereas before we only had a limited amount of time for the fun things and for the enjoyment suddenly now we have all the time in the world to comprehend the whole great grief that desolates the soul we have all this time now to fully under understand the extent of our emotions to understand how far they go how much meaning these people had to us and how just how little exactly our short time together was and uh, great is capitalized because it's enjammed over to the next line and this really draws attention to just the weight of this emotion as a whole to show how big the grief is to show how much it desolates and desolates means like wrecks but it also means uninhabited left behind it portrays how empty life is for the narrator because we have the whole soul and like a ghost that is why he wanders like this a shadow of his former self because he had these short moment but suddenly he had all this time and he understood what it's like to live without her and to what it's like to live alone now and so this has just stripped away a part of him and he has reached understanding and this is why he's no longer like himself and finally we have something long but this feeling is very bitter because it's a very sad feeling it's a feeling of finality great grief has those guttural g sounds that really catch in our throat it's hard to say it it's great grief it's almost like hard to get it out because it accurately shows us how hard it is to come to terms with death and to realize that like this is it how hard it is to live with this grief and suddenly we have a deliberate exaggeration a hyperbole when we say long long it's not just long however i do not think that this is an exaggeration i think that ultimately we do really have just this one long moment ahead of us and we do really have a very short amount of time and that is both a gift and a curse and as part of your personal response i think it's also very important to mention the meaning that you think the word after has acquired before in the poem it loomed ahead of us this just sad and horrible thing this contrast to all the fun and the kissing and the scheming and like golden dreams but now that we have witnessed what it's like to live without her, we had this grief completely desolate our soul, completely just wreck us and leave us wandering alone like a ghost. Is it actually a mercy? Is it actually a gift that we just didn't see before? That's the beauty of this poem for me, how it makes you con reconsider everything and how it makes you think of all the peace that you have through life and all of the joy that you get to experience and in the end i guess even death seems like a gift because it's a respite and it's just something different too so it's like the whole process is very precious and i think morrison just gets that across and the word sleep also brings us back to dreaming and i think this is ultimately a very positive thing for morrison almost as if 
well, because in dreaming before he remembers his moments, almost as if by going to his desk, by going to sleep for the final time, he can just transport back to these emotions. And yes, it's not real. Yes, it's not life. It's a sort of forgetting, but it's still lovely and preferable for him than just wandering around. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and it helped you prepare. So next week we have a final poem, then a quick break and some more literary content for all the people who are not doing GCSE. I do apologize. I do recognize that there was just a lot of study guides suddenly thrown at you. So thanks so much for watching and see you next week.